All right, so, um, you know, in, in tradition, my tradition, I have a very long PowerPoint, so, and um, we started a little bit late, so I'm going to try to um, sort of go as, as efficiently and quickly as I can through this. I may sort of just touch on some slides. So, um, you know, if, if I just sort of speed through a slide and then you have a question about it later, I'm happy to go back to it. But, um, you know, right now, um, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to introduce myself. Hello, I'm Mel Figueroa. I am a steering committee member of the Green Socialist Network. I'm sorry, hello? I want to get to Dave Bond's work group and they have not posted. He just put it there. Michael just okay. put it there. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, okay, so um, I'm Mel Figueroa. I'm a steering committee member of the Green Eco Socialist Network. And I'm, I also work, um, I'm here in Chico, California in occupied Machupta territory. And I work with um, Ali Metters Knight. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here today because, but for a very good reason, um, she is culturally, she's on a, a big traditional burn just up the hill from us. Um, it's the first burn that is going to test a new state law that allows for cultural burning to take place without permits from CAL FIRE. So it's a very exciting day actually for California natives um, to be able to practice traditional burning uh, in their ancestral territories um, without you know, uh, excessive government supervision for the first time. And so I'm um, really proud of them. And so um, that's also why uh, my co-presenter, Ali Matters Knight, is not here today, but we work together in um, in uh, the Chico Ecological Traditional uh, Traditional Ecological Stewardship Program, which is a program um, of the Machupta tribe, and also a community program that is um, that we're going to learn about today. So, um, in terms of you know a lot of the conversations that go on. Um, there, I, you know, there's a lot of mention of indigenous peoples. There's a lot of recognition that indigenous peoples, while being um, officially 4% of the population of the world, stewards 80% of the world's biodiversity. Um, there's this, you know, sort of vague feeling about um, that indigenous peoples and uh, ecological stewardship are tightly entwined. Um, what, I'm, what we're going to talk about here is how that is actually um, in practice. We're going to go a little bit more into depth than that and how um, the programs that tribes are under undertaking right now, um, you know, is uh, is is really deserves a lot more attention, especially from eco socialists and, um, in terms of uh, the concrete steps that are being taken to advance a just transition. Um, again, another vague term that is being discussed, but um, you know, indigenous participation and leadership is rarely mentioned. So, um, so I'm gonna go into this. Again, I'm gonna speed through some slides, but if you have questions about it, I'm happy to go back and, and, and uh, show you. Okay, oops, there we go. Okay, so um, right, you know, one of the things that when I was preparing for this presentation that I thought would be really important to highlight is um, how um, uh, not just how indigenous worldviews are compatible with eco socialism, but also importantly where they differ and where those differences can be complementary to to. Um, sort of fill out a view of eco-socialism that, you know, particular to, you know, not just in the United States, but globally, that can actually give a fuller picture and open up um, new kinds of possibilities um, for the movement and for the movement more generally. Um, those of you who were in the plenary session uh, 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 yet yeah, in the last hour, Margaret Kimberly, thank you, uh, went over the principles of eco-socialism, um, at, at least as defined by us in the eco-socialist network. And so you can see them here. And um, you know, social ownership of instruments of production, production get geared to meet human needs, democratic production decisions, um, you know, an end to the various oppressions, right? Um, and also decision-making guided by the need to restore and maintain the health of our natural ecosystem. So um, what I'm gonna introduce here are certain principles that I've learned that come from indigenous movements and indigenous culture and worldviews uh, more generally that I think, um, again, will help to 
complements and expand our understanding of just what that last bit in there um, means and um, ho hopefully perhaps some bases for building alliances with tribes where you are. Remember, especially on this continent, wherever you are, wherever you walk on this continent, there is a tribe that is associated with that place and those people are still here, um, you know. So number one, uh, what indigenous worldviews I think bring to the conversation is um, specific places, a place-based framework of understanding. And that's, you know, in, in Chico, California is the Machupta and the Maidus that have knowledge of this region. Wherever you are, there is a tribe that has deep knowledge of that, re the, of that region, including the histories of change environmental change. One of the things that we always talk about here in California is that California is only 180 years old, right? And, and it's, and, you know, uh, uh, up until recently, there were people who talked about, you know, people existing here in the 1800s as prehistoric, right? And so there's a big black box before 1850 that most people don't know anything about. And so, you know, being able to understand that respects that and understand that there are people here who knew what it looked like before and who look like who knew what the changes were here um, is really important. Um, those people developed highly, you know, advanced, more advanced than ours, knowledge systems of adaptation and co-production of a particular ecosystem and bioregion. Um, there's also, you know, things about time, right? Um, you know, we, as Marxists, we tend to think about stages of history, stages of modes of production, but, um, you know, in, in, a, in a living ecosystem, right, uh, time can be, um, you know, measured on multiple levels and multiple different kinds of dynamics. These concepts such as time and space are relational and rooted in a living ecosystem, things you can touch, smell, taste, see, hear, right? Um, I mean, I would like to argue that um, indigenous cultures do practice a kind of dialectical materialism, but you know, it's, it, it, but they don't call it that, but I think it's of a different kind. It's one based on human and non-human agency. So not only does this talk about natural processes such as, you know, fires, long, you know, volcanic eruptions, long wave ecological resets and abrupt climate changes. Climate changes have happened before in human history and there is knowledge and memory of those things but also the intelligence and sentience of non-human life and its responses to disruption. And this is not, you know, um, Western uh, systems tend to have that, uh, you know, divide between culture and nature. But, um, you know, I mean, as literally I have experienced in tending the land, um, you know, uh, and, and learning about traditional ecological knowledge, uh, we are not the only uh, uh, controllers of, uh, of these systems, pollinators, birds, uh, beavers, um, even water itself and rocks are, um, you know, have a logic to them and ones that can be understood. And, for, you know, again, uh, if you look at the, the points on top, a lot of those are talking about so forms of social organization, which is great, right? Um, but I think, um, and, and having read, uh, you know, Vangloria and certain um, indigenous scholars, um, you know, when you have a place-based sort of framework of understanding, you're less concerned with that stages, the stage model or modes of production than maintaining an ethic, right? So maintaining the social relations that connect people to a place, that make people in tune with a place and not in a, I mean, yes, in a metaphysical way, but also in a very, um, you know, like, like real sort of way. Um, in terms of the social relations that can reproduce an ecosystem. So not just social reproduction of people, but social reproduction of ecosystems. And when you um, really connect it to the material uh, functions of the land in that sense, um, the, the, the distinction between base and superstructure, which a lot of, you know, it's been a point of debate along, of, among many Marxists, kind of disappears. Right. And so the the major differences which are important, but also complementary that I see is that in an eco socialist framework and in a Marxist framework, we talk about mode of production based on time and history. And but 
you know, sort of not just adding, but like integrating um, an indigenous worldview also gives us um, a sense of a mode of relationship, right, based on place and very specific places. And um, if you want to read more about that, uh, the Diné scholar um, J Glenn Clothard and Vine Deloria Jr. talk a lot about um, the, the relationship between these two worldviews. So what is traditional ecological knowledge? So um, as I mentioned before, um, it is a system, it's a knowledge system of ecological science and technology developed by indigenous peoples over 200, I mean, over, well, yes, 200,000 because, you know, and, and uh, uh, humans have been around for 200,000 years, but also at least over 20,000 years. And as you know, some cultures know much longer, but uh, let's, let, we'll stick to the generally accepted uh, definition of 20,000 years. But, and um, it, it does have a scientific method um, that's different from the Western scientific method, but it's based on long-term observation, experiment, and especially outcomes. Right, um, you know, all of all of this, you know, speculation is great, but does your community get fed? Does your community get housed? Does your community have, uh, you know, sustainability and longevity for the next seven generations? Right, conservation of inhabited landscapes. So there is, in in most indigenous languages, there is no word for wild. Right, wild is a 19th century colonial conception. Um, indigenous peoples have inhabited lands all over the planet extensively and they have privileged knowledge meaning you know just based on like tenure of being in a place they know more than the rest of us about a specific place and that's something i think that we all need to accept um you know western sort of science and and colonial culture has has kind of like erased a lot of that and so we need to like kind of bring that humility back i think um, to certain places. Um, again, and it's privileged knowledge of specific landscapes associated with their territory. They've evolved with co ecosystems through adaptive selection. Um, you know, a huge uh, uh, example that we work with is willow. You know, willow is um, has been around as long as humans have. It is one of the first um, species that humans have co-evolved with and, and quote unquote domesticated. Um, and you can see that in the genetic history of willow species. Um, indigenous peoples have lived through historical periods of abrupt climate change and have privileged knowledge of how their landscapes respond to change and how to actively manage responses. You know, there are folks that have been through this before and we can learn from them. And, you know, if we can get past the colonial biases and mindsets that we've, that's been drilled into us our, our, our entire lives, um, you know, we can see the possibilities that open uh, once we are open to listening. So what does this mean? What does this place, what does this relation to place mean, right? Um, and, and what are some operational concepts that we can work with to try to bridge these gaps and to try to you know, find a common ground? Um, well, one of them is uh, looking at the species of a place, right? So cultural keystone species, the idea that plants and animals that play critical roles in maintaining ecosystems, what we know in ecological science as keystone species, also happen to be really culturally significant species to a people, right? In diets, materials, medicine, language, traditions, um, and, and religion. You know, if, if, a, if a indigenous tribe has a dance for a particular plant or an animal, they must be pretty um, uh, important in that, in, in that place. <clears throat> there is no, you know, in, in, in many indigenous cultures, there is no concept of private property, because if you know your place, and you know that your place is going to get hit with some disaster at some point or another, it doesn't really make sense to have like title to one piece of land and stay there and you can't go anywhere else. Like, you know, if you know a fire is going to go through it, sometimes private property doesn't seem so attractive, right? So there was seasonal migration. There were places that people knew to go. I was just reading this this morning about um, a place in Greenland where um, in the last big ice age, there were really active sites that were that were active for like a hundred years and then disappeared, 
right? That's because those were like really good places to go when there were, you know, ice storms or disruptions or, or climate changes, right? So the redundancy of places where you can go. And so many of us, you know, in late capitalism feel so trapped. And those of us that don't even have private property have nowhere to go. And so having somewhere to go is a really important um, feature of social resiliency as well as ecological resiliency. Now, one of the reasons, you know, that that um, it's important to learn these things is be, and is because, you know, this needs to become the norm, right? And this is where I think, you know, even you know, old anarchists like myself, um, you know, have have learned to say, you know, in this place, if we're talking about surviving in a place, I have to accept the authority of an indigenous government or an indigenous people. Because, um, you know, I have the humility to know that I don't know and that everyone must learn these basic ecosystem dynamics and cultural speed and not just for tribal members, but everyone who touches the land. Right. And that is a way of, again, sovereignty. Right. Um, the doing causes the knowing. And I've see, I see some people here in the audience that work with us at um, in Chico at TEK Chico and and, and we know, you know, after over a year of, of just going regularly back to one place and tending it and watching the changes, the doing causes the knowing, right? And, you know, it's, it's not like an extra thing. It's not like an extra hobby you do on your spare time, right? Doing this is important because we will, we depend on our ecosystem for everything, food ways, medicine, you know, timekeeping and social organization. Um, I've gone over a lot of this before, but a couple of things I'm going to point out on this slide is um, is uh, uh, this picture right up here. So this is a simulated satellite image of California at the beginning of colonization in 1851. And this is an actual satellite image of California in 2013. And so you can see very dramatically the ecological change that's been taken, right? Um, again, uh, uh, at least 21,000 years of tenure in this place is, um, is, is, sci is scientifically documented um, by, um, by Western science. Indigenous peoples have memories of much longer. They don't have, a lot of California tribes do not have stories of migration. Um, they consider themselves to have been created in this place. And if you look at that 1851 picture, you see all of these watersheds. You see so much water um, in, in places that are devoid of water now, right? And those watersheds were very key to tribal occupation, trade, land management, as well as food security, okay? And here is another map of the United States you may not have seen before, which is the pre-colonial trade routes. Um, you know, uh, uh, so many stories, colonial stories of indigenous settlement talk about, you know, isolated wandering bands of people. And that was just not the case. There was a highly developed economy that was here. It was an economic system of trade, of, you know, um, a common land management, of taking care of, of you know, sacred places that were sacred to multiple tribes. And as you can see on the on the coast, um, California was the most diverse place um, pre-colonially here. There, there are uh, currently over 100 and, um, 109 federally recognized tribes and scores of non-federally recognized tribes that are still live in California. There are 175 language groups and they all live together and had relationships with each other. There, um, a lot of these trade routes and tribal territories were based on watershed boundaries and um, creeks and rivers were the freeways of um, pre-colonial life. And so when you think, when, when you get this sort of alternate picture, the real picture of what this continent looked like, you know, before colonization, when you think about it, you know, at, at, at 1850, being on, you know, uh, uh, um, or well, let's go a little bit back before, um, like 1450, really being on a, a very um, a, a similar level of development as the rest of the world. This is where this opens up a whole different 
I mean, at least for me, it's opened up a whole different level of possibility, a whole different understanding of this place that, you know, um, uh, that, that, uh, uh, you know, kind of, um, it gives us a vision of where things could go, right? Um, and, and could be. Right? Um, not only was, was there extensive contact and trade on the continent, there was extensive contact and trade um, out, you know, outside the continent as well. So, um, you know, the, the freeways of the watersheds um, can also apply to ocean currents. And California tribes have stories of what's called the Rainbow Bridge that connected, um, you know, Pacific peoples and Hawaiians and California tribes. So, um, you know, and, and as we know, you know, Polynesians and, and all of this was based on, you know, ocean currents, star navigations, and also seasonality. There are only certain times when you could use the Rainbow Bridge, and those were based on climate cycles. And so that TEK and that shared TEK um, uh, are things that, um, that can help us today and can also um, help to explain some of the things that might be coming down the line. Of course, California, as we know, is often um, in the news because of climate change related disasters. Um, you know, California, I've, I've come to know as sort of the disaster place. Um, California has never had a stable ecosystem, but um, climate change is making those uh, cycles of disruption uh, uh, more intense and more frequent. So we have wildfires, extreme high temperatures, extreme drought and extreme flooding. And indeed, these two bottom pictures are of the same exact place, Oroville Dam. So you have this in 2017 with the flood that almost caused uh, the dam to collapse. And then here we have 2021 in the drought. So again, um, you know, kind of trying to, trying to establish a stable baseline for California doesn't really work. And so, you know, one of the things that we've learned up here, so just seven miles up the hill from us is Paradise, California, which was destroyed uh, utterly in the 2018 campfire. And we've learned a lot of lessons from being in a post-disaster frontline community. Uh, wildfires have exposed many of the social vulnerabilities of Californians to natural and man-made disasters, not just PG&E and its dangerous infrastructure, um, it makes me shudder when, you know, I hear uh, even progressives talk about, you know, expanding hydro energy and high distance transmissions and connecting grids. Like to me, that's, that, that sounds like death to me because deaths have happened because of these things. So um, again, that, that very specific connection to place is very powerful. Um, again, wildfires are happening more and more intense every year because of forest mismanagement, right? Total fire suppression, the diversion of water, um, the, 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 the transformation of ecosystems. So like trees and plants that really shouldn't be here are here and driving wildfires. Um, and that's on top of climate change. That was gonna happen before climate change just amplified it and turned it up to 11. Um, we have a housing crisis. So um, Chico um, and Butte County, actually the county where I live is um, the county with the most inequality in the country. And it has the highest per capita homeless rate um, in California. And um, per capita, of course, you know, being proportionate to the population. And that's because everywhere around us has burned. All of these communities have been displaced. And there is no, I mean, there's right now, there's very little happening in the way of addressing that. Um, and it took a federal lawsuit to even make the little thing happen. Um, you know, there are not many opportunities in the job market. Every, you know, every community around here is, uh, is a depressed community. The logging industry has gone, um, you know, hydro is going, you know, um, and there's a high cost of education. Nobody wants to go into debt anymore to, um, to try to get these tech jobs in the Bay Area. It's, it's not viable. And also, you know, before, <clears throat> it's a lot better in the last two years, but before um, when I came in after the campfire, um, agencies were just kind of chickens with their heads cut off, running in different directions. Um, the complexity of the problem is, you know, has, has necessitated this need to collaborate and looking at the scope, the scope of the problem that transcends um, current political boundaries, that transcends different levels of jurisdiction. Um, you know, has, has really spoken to this need for a viable solution. 
But if you look at it from the perspective of a California native, if you look at it from the perspective of peoples that have been here for, um, for long, you know, long, long before the 180 years that California has existed, um, for them, for, for California natives, the, the catastrophe began 180 years ago. The catastrophe began in 1850. And so when we look at the sort of long durée vision of, of, of California's problems, um, it puts it in a whole different context. We have legacies um, as, as you know, I've been sort of articulating uh, this, you know, the square part of Northern California, that part that nobody knows, you know, thinks anything about until it's on fire, right? Is a colonial, has a colonial relationship to the Bay Area, has a colonial relationship to Los Angeles. Um, if you look at the materials that flow from that place and the ecological costs of those extractive industries. In, 18, in the 1850s, of course, you had gold, but after that you had logging. So much of the 50s suburbs, you know, in Los Angeles and in the Bay Area were, were built with trees that were logged from, the, from, from Northern California. And today, 75% of the water um, that is consumed in the metropolitan areas comes from that, that square area north of Sacramento. So 70% of the precipitation falls north of Sacramento and 75% of that goes elsewhere, right? And so what are the consequences that we, have, that we see now? So the consequences of this colonial extraction is just is coming up now in our face so that we can no longer ignore them. There's, you know, arsenic levels from gold mining um, that still contribute to the um, the poisoning of the groundwater that most of us drink. Um, it, again, fires um, are from this logging industry that has replaced 98% of the native um, ecosystems and oak woodlands in Northern California. And of course the water, right? Um, all the dams for electricity and the dams that bring water to the metropolitan areas has, um, you know, has, has resulted in the disappearance of salmon, has dried out the landscape so that it's more vulnerable to wildfires. Um, and so we have to think about not just climate change happening now, but this 180 years of ecological catastrophe with climate change piled on top of it, right? And that's, that's one way of thinking about, again, California. We also have climate cycles that are becoming more intense with climate change. Um, the El Nino and La Nina years, about every seven to 10 years, um, there's a climate cycle that brings storms. And the one thing I wanna point out here is the 200 year flood. So this is something that, um, you know, obviously the California natives know about because they have records of every 200 years, a big flood coming and turning the entire Central Valley basically into a drainage bin, right? Um, and, and again, if California is only 180 years old, how would you know about the 200 year flood? Well, actually we kind of do know because it, the last time it happened was in 1862, right at the early period of the gold rush, which um, you know, we don't even know how many people died because there, it was the wild west and there were no records of it. But we do know that it put Sacramento under 30 feet of water. We do know that countless uh, infrastructures were destroyed and a lot of people died. Um, a lot of the original 49ers were wiped out by this flood. And, you know, um, and, and what we also know, uh, at least from indigenous stories, is that the Hawaiians that were in California during the gold rush, who had knowledge of these El Nino cycles, who had knowledge of um, you know, these, these events that happened went around to the, to the tribes in California, warning them up to two years before the flood happened. And so a lot of natives like abandoned the valley and they went up to higher ground, right, to prepare for the flood. And, um, you know, there are, there are the accounts that say that, you know, the, the natives mysteriously disappeared and the miners were only happy to take over those village lands and uh, like right next to the river, right? <laughs> and we're like, woohoo, we got land, we got private property. And then what happened? A big flood, right? And so these are the, the kinds of things that, you know, um, the, the kinds of um, assumptions when we, we're thinking about our assumptions about, you know, our ecological future, um, these are things that we have to integrate um, into our assumptions or else, you know, 
we don't want to end up like those folks down by the river, right? And so um, what we're really talking about here is disaster mitigation, right? It is too late to stop climate change, um, at least significant climate change. Even if we stopped burning fossil fuels now, and we still do, right? Um, we still have to deal with the after effects of, um, again, um, you know, the last couple of centuries of industrial civilization. So, um, you know, but, and, and, and so we need to, protect our communities and how do we do that we have to we have to have that knowledge of how to predict major events their outcomes and how to minimize damage and recovery time for both land and people right and what does disaster capitalism do now right um disaster capitalism doesn't really you know land and people sure but uh we really need to like focus on our disaster response to protect property right um, all of our resources, all those billions of dollars, and I've seen it in action, right, go to protect property structures, right? Um, it's a militarized response. So, you know, I'm a type two uh, trained wildland firefighter, and in my training, it was all very military for plan of attack, containment, right? And then the disaster recovery, right? These corporations, these giant corporations come in, and they want to, you know, they clean up the place, they spend billions and billions of dollars to do a really shitty job of cleaning up. And the, then, you know, the, the town council and, you know, the state and other folks are focused on rebuilding and capturing value from the disaster areas. Paradise, which was a low income community, mostly low income community of 26,000 people now has barely 2000 people there. And, you know, you see Mo manufactured homes on pieces of land selling for five hundred thousand dollars, right? It is it is aspirationally a gentrifier's paradise, but it's not quite happening because nobody can afford that, right? But if you can see, um, you know, dis disaster capitalism does not focus on land or people. Disaster capitalism focuses on capturing value and protecting value, right? And 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 we see this. Um, on and, and then when it comes to mitigation, right, when it comes to preparing for future disasters that we know are going to happen, um, they concentrate on hoarding resources. So the water wars right now are absolutely focused on this hoarding of resources and groundwater banks and the twin tunnels and making new reservoirs and dams, um, hoping that they're going to just centralize these resources and have control over their distribution, meaning that they're being they're going to be able to capture value from hoarding and having control over distribution. A TEK approach, which you know, uh, Ali and I have been calling disaster indigenism, is quite different, right? Um, based on the twenty thousand long durée knowledge of how people have survived in this place, right? Um, it, looking at, you know, those trade routes, looking at that inner tribal cooperation, looking, looking at large scale land management for predictable outcomes of species survival and ecosystem resilience. So one of the things that we do um, in, in Chico is like, you know, we put stuff in places that we know are going to flood. We're training plants to basically be able to take the hit and come back quickly. We're seed banking, right? Um, <clears throat> a social, the social economy that inhabited those trade routes and that map that I showed you was all about that trade and cooperation. Um, and, you know, when one place is hit by a disaster, you can go to a certain place to get the seeds to be able to, you know, uh, rebuild your food pantry, you know, and, and food pantries are in the ground, right? Tree and tuber agriculture, things that are hardy and that can last and that can, that people know where to go and to sustain it. And that took people, right? Um, community land management, and these were large scale labor intensive, right? And because it was just life, for people, everybody participated in it from the children to the elders. It was based on this knowledge of weather cycles, seasonality, um, long-term climate patterns and active human management. You had to tend to these places for them to be able to, to, to grow. And you know, what does that mean in our in, in industrial, you know, sometimes it seems irreparably industrial capitalist world today? Um, well, what that means is jobs. 
What that means is a workforce development program. What that means is being able to engage people um, you know, uh, uh, in the very much needed and thankfully now better funded um, initiatives to manage our ecosystems. And so um, when we talk about just transition, we're not just talking about energy. We're not actually talking about a lot about energy at all in insofar as we're talking about sort of like the way that we manage um, how energy flows through our ecosystems. And we can do that by creating workforces, by training people on what this is and how to do it so that, you know, um, and, and with under tribally led programs so that, you know, uh, um, people can sort of experience this, um, not sort of as a hobby, but as a, a, an, a real livelihood. And we see that all over the world as well, that bringing traditional livelihoods um, are is not just equitable, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's good for the environment and, and all of us as well. Um, so I'm just gonna speed over this. This is an example of the Karuk Tribes Climate Adaptation Plan. Uh, tribes are starting to codify these in climate change programs, in adaptation programs, and in cultural resources protection programs, which I'll go over as well. But a lot of this is about, you know, taking these damaged ecosystems and putting them back into a resilient and um, biodiverse state. And, um, and that's for everyone's survival. So I know a lot of people, you know, have heard this term land back, right? This is now like a really, um, a universal uh, uh, a rallying cry for tribes across the United States. But there's a lot of different interpretations of what land back means. A lot of, some of them come from, you know, uh, again, the, these colonial notions of ethno-nationalism. Do I have to move back to Germany? You know, all of these things. And, you know, um, at least in, 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 in this region, and le at least for for um, the Machupta and for um, Ali and myself, um, you know, land back has really um, meant, you know, sort of boiling it down to th different dimensions of what that means. Number one is the social dimension, right? And that is for tribal members, that's for, you know, people who are, you know, part of, of these families that it's, it's important to return those traditional life ways and, and the social relations and those continuity of cultural practices. So what Ali is doing right now, um, burning for the first time in a traditional way, um, you know, a, a large scale burn is, is really, really important. Um, it's an ecological question. It's the return of that land-based ethic. It's the return of those social relations of reproduction of a system, of a particular system. Right. Um, I can't take what I've learned here in Chico and like, you know, randomly go to the East Coast and tell people what to do. That's not my place. Right. What my place is, is to learn about this place where I live and spend my days. And then finally, it is a political question. Right. Um, when we, you know, we accept city government leadership over the places where we live. We accept county government leadership over the places that we live. We accept state and federal leadership over the places that we live. But not a lot of people even think to accept tribal leadership over the places that we live. And that is an important part of what land back means is the political control of land use and land management decisions, not just on their reservation, but in all the territories where it used to be, right? So, you know, we have to get a permit from the city, right? But we can't consult with a tribe as to like where, you know, where the hell we actually, this place is and what needs to be in this place. Um, those are things that can actually, um, you know, change the culture and change, um, uh, uh, change land management for everybody, right? And so you may not have to move back to Germany, but you know you have to consult with the tribe. You actually have to, under law right now, consult with the tribe if you build things, um, you know, in certain places. So um, that's that's one of the the you know political claims of land back. That's very very important for us all. So you know, um, and so that actually kind of puts a really different spin on things when you think about tribal sovereignty. And I've been starting to think about tribal sovereignty in terms of, 
you know, dual power. And if you think about, you know, um, Lenin, when he wrote this in April 1917, he's going back to Russia from Finland and he's observing all of these villages that are like self-sufficient, self-governing villages. And he's like, nobody thought of this. We've been thinking about, you know, um, we've been thinking about sort of how do we take over the, the central government in a huge way, but we didn't even think about the fact that these folks don't even think about the central government because they are, because there's, 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 there's powers, the de facto power really lies in the hands of the community. And so that to him was the key to the Russian revolution. And so we can kind of think in a, in a similar way about, um, you know, uh, about this continent, because, you know, as we're taught this, you know, the tribes are, you know, relics of the past, and this is the only map that matters. But, you know, when you live in, a, in and work in a tribal community, there's, it's almost like a, a, a sort of parallel dimension that exists, because it's not the only power, you know, um, state power is actually held by tribes. And that opens up a lot of possibilities. Federally recognized tribes are sovereign national governments under the law. They are what are called domestic dependent nations, which means that they don't, um, uh, international law is not applicable to tribes. So there's a lot of movement for um, the U.S. to sign the, the U.N. Declaration on Indigenous People so that they could be they could be um, subject to the free prior informed consent laws. But right now it's not applicable. But there are lots of domestic laws that actually are more powerful than um, uh, FPIC um, that people uh, and us communities can help tribes enforce today. They are state apparatuses with legal powers and infrastructure. In a local jurisdiction, their power by law technically supersedes state and local and municipal. So they're effectively federal agencies and local jurisdictions. And they also have rights to governance per the federal trust responsibility on ancestral territories. That is in that is the obligation of the federal government under the law to provide for autonomy and provision of care. And these laws have been upheld by the Supreme Court again and again uh, throughout the 20th century. So when we think about you know, the possibilities that what we can do, um, you know, we've seen, say, the, the Chickasaw Nation has used, you know, CARE Act funds to actually model different ways of dealing with COVID that are much more effective than what any, you know, uh, the, any of us can do right now, right? Um, there are, you know, housing, if you, you know, uh, David, uh, we'll talk later about Dishkamu Humble and like these housing programs that can be, um, that can be done under tribal sovereignty and authority that can open ways that, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, non-native organizations and governments are, you know, uh, have barriers to right now. So this is one of the things to, to think about when we think about, you know, what kind of solidarity do we have with um, sovereign tribal nations and what kinds of relationships of trust um, can and must we um, uh, uh, um, cultivate with, with tribes across the nation. Um, today, uh, tribal sovereignty is being exercised in a number of ways, food sovereignty, water protection, uh, direct repatriation of land, cultural fire, which Ali is on right now, um, protection of sacred sites and rights of nature. These are all things that, are, um, that have been enacted and are enforceable under tribal law. Um, and and, you know, but that enforcement also depends on the rest of us being able to accept and articulate those um, uh, in, in the general public. These are two um, executive orders coming down from the federal government that have um, actually enabled a lot of these to happen. A presidential memorandum of officially recognizing indigenous traditional ecological knowledge as a body of science that will inform federal decision making and a joint secretarial order from the Departments of Interior and Agriculture that officially commits to fulfill the federal trust responsibility to tribes, meaning co-management and co-stewardship of federal lands and waterways. That co-management is a term that has been bitterly fought for by tribes over the last several years. 
Um, a lot of times the federal government would be like, oh, I don't know about co-management. How about we let you do this thing over here? And they're like, nope, co-management. And that means funding, that means programs, that means education, and that means workforce development. So how we're implementing this here is um, in, in sort of three ways. So um, it, local here in Butte County in Chico, we have a city park. Verbena Fields, which is a 17 acre native restoration and interpretive park. Every Friday, um, we invite members of the community to come out and tend the land with us. And you know, based on seasonality, based on the responses of the plants, there are different things to do every week. But I think, you know, and and I invite some of the folks who are on this call that that do work at Verbena Fields to share some of their experiences of you know really paying attention to one place for a whole year cycle and really understanding what this means. Um, the, the tribe has also designated Ali as the master TEK practitioner for the tribe and um, has and, and we've developed a TEK certification uh, curriculum, which means um, both native and non-native people can come and train in these um, in, in certain skills. And so there's sometimes there are certain skills for a specific plant like willow. Sometimes there are um, things like, you know, fires, there are something, some other things like res riparian restoration that, um, that the tribe issues a certificate from and that, you know, and we're also working with these agencies to show that that's worth something. So like you need a certification to fell a tree. Well, you also need a certification to restore, um, res restore a, 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 a creek, right? Um, it's this, it's almost like that, it's like a degree and in some ways, it's more advanced than a college degree um, in terms of that. We also have created jobs. We've created up to 15 jobs in land management contracting. So um, we have now specialized in, in, in three different areas, forestry and fuels management, cultural and prescribed fire, and also ecosystem restoration planning and revegetation. And as of uh, March, uh, we, we have a deadline of February 24th because the National Super Forest Supervisor is retiring and she doesn't have anything good to tell the president in terms of her work with tribes. So she's trying to get this uh, a rush through so that she has something to say, uh, which works for us. Uh, we are getting um, facilities for an intertribal seed bank and uh, at the Mendocino uh, Seed Orchard right here in Chico. And you know we have almost 100 native plant species that we gather and process and store um, some of which, um, you know, aren't even sold on the market. They're rare endemic species um, that we are using now to restore public lands more generally. And so uh, tekchico.org is the website if you want to learn more about it. But, um, and these are the strategies that we use. So right now, um, uh, if, if people are not familiar with what's called the TIPO Office of Many Tribes, that's the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. Um, the TIPO office is, um, there is a, um, it's a living, it's cultural resources. And before recently, most of it was only concerned with archeological remains like stones, bones, village sites, um, you know, massacre sites, um, whatever. But um, what what we've done in the, um, in the Machupta tribe is basically like create two different departments. So um, there is a TIPO officer, a, a certified TIPO officer to, to handle archeological remains. And Ali as the master TEK practitioner is responsible for consultation on living cultural resources, plants, animals, and, and ecosystems. And um, there are requirements by state and federal law. You must consult with a tribe before changing general plans, before designating open spaces, before developing. And so um, those tribal consultation requirements can be leveraged to secure land stewardship contracts for living cultural resources. And we've been able to successfully leverage those um, and you know, to, to get projects and get access to land, get access to you know, places that are special um, to the tribe. This has also necessitated a culture shift in local, state, and federal agencies. Um, you know, tribal consultation was kind of like a checkbox and a throwaway. But now 
we've kind of wrestled them down where they have to be much more robust and to recognize those, those values and those mutual benefits. And of course, we're developing that high-skilled workforce. So we've got forestry certifications, our crew's got fire certifications, they have TEK certifications, and planning and monitoring. They, this riparian project that we're starting on Tuesday, um, they were trained and they developed a plan for it which you know, according to the agencies was the best plan that they'd ever seen for a riparian restoration. Um, we are also working with other tribes in the region, um, you know, using those, old, those, those trade routes and the understanding of those trade routes and tribal agreements to um, combine work, tribal workforces, to train together and to work together to access lands um, for wildfire recovery and to protect cultural resources. Uh, we've also kind of infiltrated, um, uh, uh, you know, public uh, agencies and recommendations for forest health, especially after the campfire. So, you know, having people understand that those are oak, oak woodlands, oak woodlands need to go back, pines don't need to go back, right, and, and, and bringing back good fire. And, and again, those years and years of of, um, of careful community education has, you know, resulted in the fact that there is a large traditional burn happening today um, for the first time. So, you know, this expands the, the nation building capacity um, of tribes for, by contracting for public lands, um, it's increasing uh, you know, access and use rights for traditional territories under public jurisdiction. Um, as the certification program allows the Machupta tribe to retain knowledge sovereignty and develop the workforce on their terms, right? And, and, um, and not have that knowledge be stolen by universities or pub other public agencies. And it also, again, builds that capacity towards a solidarity economy, a new social economy um, based on land stewardship, food sovereignty, disaster mitigation, and climate adaptation. That sovereignty kind of protects the, the project, it protects the movement and it brings the whole community in to seeing that vision, seeing, you know, um, and, and work toward, together towards that vision. Um, and so I'm gonna, um, whew, I'm right at the end, top of the hour. So I'm sorry if I don't have questions, maybe I'll take five minutes since I started 10 minutes late. Um, I'm just going to, to, um, to end here. With this quote from Frantz Fanon, Wretched of the Earth, it's my favorite quote, because it talks about, you know, consolidating a movement and a vision and a people based on a, an actual physical project on the land, a project of rebuilding economies and resilience and survival. And that's what I actually see happening in this place, in this place where, you know, I've put in a lot, you know, uh, put in daily work. To, to help build this. So I see the possibility and I can see this happen. And this is happening all over, all over the country, probably where you're at too. So, um, so I encourage you know, folks to pay attention and to um, you know, come in in a good way, right? Respectfully and humbly um, with uh, tribal nations that are doing this work in your area. All right, so um, I'm gonna stop here and uh, is it okay if I take five minutes for for questions? Um, since I started ten minutes late. Sure, go ahead. All right, cool. <laughs> All right, does anybody have any questions? Oh, here we go. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, Laura, go ahead. I'm going to try to grab some from the chat too. Okay. Um, there's uh, somebody in the an activist in San Francisco who is talking about the uh, negative effects. It's something that I don't understand that well about people who want to that only have native species and how it's actually not an ecological um, movement that's happening. Uh, is there? And sorry, it's such a vague question, but can you, uh, do you know of that? People who are saying only native plants and actually their, uh, their motives are not um, to save oh. them. So like, well, <laughs> you're talking about the California Native Plant Society. Oh, I named, named didn't I? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, 
Um, the organization itself has become a lot more open to TEK. We've presented with them. Um, we're going to have presented with them twice now. Um, but a lot of the membership, a lot of, you know, I mean, it's kind of a colonial idea too to say like only this and everything else has to, you know, has to go. It's, it's also something that's not responsive to the idea. I mean, that said, there are absolutely invasive plants that cannot be in an area. So one of the things that we have to deal with is things like scotch broom, right? So scotch broom, French broom, Spanish broom, we're all brought in by the mining companies to plant on mine tailings so that they'll say, hey, look, we've there's no there's new vegetation. Unfortunately, those things are full of nitrogen and in a wildfire, they basically act like a nuclear bomb. So those they're invasive species that crowd out the rest of the ecosystem that we absolutely have to eradicate. But just like, you know, just like people, right? There are species, there are other species that come in and they, they're what's called they naturalize, right? So species like mullein and a couple other um, like non-native species that have medicinal properties that are useful to people, um, but don't come in in an invasive way, meaning they they spread, they over dominate and out compete other species and they change the soil so that no other species can grow except it, you know? Um, there are plants that don't act that way. And so, you know, in Bermuda fields and other places, um, you know, we kind of let, let it let it stay there because it's okay, it'll naturalize. And it's kind of a metaphor for, for human beings as well, right? So if you have, you know, again, that, that ethno-nationalism, like, okay, we're gonna come in, colonize an area and kick everybody out. But then there are, you know, settlers that can come in in a good way. And actually, um, you know, reading the history of this place in Butte County, I found out that, you know, even during the genocides, there were a lot of settler families that, um, that, that refused that and actually joined the natives to defend the natives against the, the, the Indian killers. So there's always that. And um, again, if you have a land-based ethic and you are vigilant and you pay attention to your landscape, you can tell that, you know, so. That's sort of the way we approach it. Um, yes, I can provide a copy of the presentation so folks can can um, uh, can like look at that. Um, and it's eleven oh six. So if there's no other pressing questions, um, I can go ahead and send it over to the next session. So great, thank you, Mel. That was great. That was um, that was fascinating.